Jupiter 9! Jupiter 9! Live on the internet! It's excellent! <laughs> Welcome to Jupiter at Night. My name is Chris. My name is Jeremy. Hey there, J-Man. Party on, Chris. Party on, (laughs) J-Man. Tonight we're talking about NASA. They've had a pretty busy week. Lots of space news. Well, a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But something really cool this week. Tell well, us about a the few 3D things. sun, dude. You know, they actually took the uh, the impetus of the Super Bowl, yeah, and they took that <laughs> opportunity to announce a number of really cool things they've got they, coming up. They, they are cool, and they they took a little ad time, even I guess. Yeah, which I don't actually recall the seeing the NASA. That's religion. probably why they're having budget concerns. Stereos. Yeah, <laughs> <There's> <laughs> that they too. paid for a Super we're Bowl. We're not going to get into the budget stuff so much tonight, I don't think, because that's a whole nother show, really. But there's a lot of NASA topics to cover. But the one I think we should start with is the one that kind of broke today as we're recording this, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and this is the uh, the two-pair twin satellites that they launched called Stereo quite a while ago. Uh, in 2006, okay. they reached that... Uh, well, if you watch the, the little graphic that we're playing behind us, they reached that first point in 2006, and then they split off from each other. And yeah. since that point, they've been trying to get to a, a, a peripheral point of view so that they can see the entire sun at the same time. Yeah. So now for the first time in human history, in the history of mankind... We now have the, the capability of seeing the entire sun at the same time. The whole sun at once. Yeah. And that's pretty neat because then you can see storms happening on all sides mm-hmm. around it. And it's, it's really cool the way they launch these uh, these things and then they eventually split apart and go out there and you know they have to line up and maneuver and they strategically. Themselves. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is, that's really high tech. Plus, you really have to appreciate just how massive of an object this is that we've now been, you know, managing space travel for this long and we still mm-hmm. haven't gotten to this point. Right. Like when I heard this, I thought, oh yeah, I guess that would be something that we would have to... Accomplished. Well, they in this video that you're watching, there's a link in our show notes. It's worth watching. It's only three minutes. Take that time out of your day to see why this is important. Um, the sun is really important to spaceflight. It's the only source of what you might term weather outside of our own um, atmosphere. Yeah, it has uh, solar storms. Solar storms, uh, emissions from the surface of it, radiation, uh, all this kind of stuff can impact uh, communications, satellite communications, um, space and, and air, and even like yeah. naval travel and navigation on the yeah. and power grids. If the solar flares are powerful enough, they can actually knock out power grids on the on the ground here. That's pretty freaky. So being able to understand how they operate and maybe if you can pro- spot them before well, they happen, is that kind of the yeah idea? yeah? Think of this. I mean, if they can penetrate our atmosphere at, and oh. knock out power grids, what can, what are they going to do with a spaceship? Dude, Norbert's getting fried. Man. Exactly. You got to know when those things are coming. So you can put on the shielding and get under your your hypothermic totally. blankets and everything, you know. <laughs> Hide. You need to get well, like you know. I think we've all seen the sci-fi where there's some ship and it has like some sort of core protected area that you, like the crew has to run into right. for radiation protection, and one person like doesn't make it, and yeah. they're like, "Go on without me." <laughs> exactly. And, and they just melt. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that would we don't want that. No. So instead, you got to launch stereo satellites. I guess. So you can see when they're coming. Yeah. This is to me. This is impor- as important knowing the sun's weather is just as important to space travel as knowing the Earth's weather would be to naval travel. Sure, I could. you got to know when hurricanes are coming or, or all that kind of and stuff. If, and if they keep working on their uh, solar sail technologies, then they're really going to need to know all that kind right. of stuff. Uh, the other thing that came up for the Super Bowl and NASA on during the pre-show, like I didn't see this part of it, but I guess GM ran a, a sponsored like mm-hmm. Super Bowl pre-show, and that's a pretty standard affair. Right. And in there was a sneak peek of a new robot from NASA and GM. Yeah, GM, I think, actually built it with yeah. assistance from NASA through some sort of contracting, blah, blah, blah. Oh, Who sure, really cares yeah. about that, right? Yeah. What we care about is the fact, how soon will this thing gain sentience and kill us? Yeah, now here's a couple of important key notes there. It has no legs. Okay, so you can't outrun it. But not so important in space. That's true. So you might you might end up with, you know, a different situation now. And on the ground, you're fine. You're right. safe. I love that this graphic actually has it holding a gun. That's well, perfect. Here's that that that's what I wanted to put because we're having good fun here with <laughs> with this. But it is kind of funny that that's the promo image they decided to share. Yeah. Now you were telling me earlier what's really unique about it is its hand architecture. Yeah, actually, that's the whole reason that this. This I almost called it a monster robot is is so impressive is because its hand and arm movements are 
approximations of humans, yeah. including grip strength, and uh, it can actually, it's got sensors and motors that can allow it to, to avoid damage to itself very yeah. easily. They're showing in the picture. Um, that but yeah, it's got fully video. articulated digits um, that allow it to hold anything that a human hand would hold. So like that a means- gun like a gun, but like all sorts of other tools that you might use. Yeah, in sp- screwdrivers. So that means that they no longer, if these things work in zero G and they, they become a new standard for working robots, you no longer have to build an entire separate set of tools just for a robot to use. Well, and, and, and imagine how good, how important that is when you have to consider your payload of what you're getting up out of the atmosphere right. and every pound probably counts. Exactly. You don't want to have <clears throat> to send up two forms of a screwdriver if this... Yeah. Yeah. If this thing can use the standard. You know, this makes me realize, though, that 2001 Space Odyssey got it wrong. Because the primary really? premise where all the trouble begins to go down is they go out. Uh, I thought Frank, it was the monkeys when the trouble starts. Well, okay, true. But what really, what, but, but Hal really throws down when Frank goes out in the repair pod, right? right? Yeah. And he has to go out there and repair the transmitter. Mm-hmm. But why wouldn't you instead just throw one, out one of these repair robots out there? Well, because that, that was 2001 and this is 2011. Mm-hmm. So they call. didn't have those yet. All right, yet. you got me there. You can't argue. <laughs> hey, dude, that's science right there. Uh, so we've got links in the show notes where you can read more about this a robot. It's pretty cool. NASA's got so a nice it's already planned it. to go up on a shuttle launch coming soon. Uh, oh, no kidding. I don't know if this information is still up to date, but I'm showing February 24th. Boy, I mean, speaking of NASA stuff, there isn't a lot of shuttle launches left, so that's really nice that it's able to get on there and go up yeah. for the ride. And actually, on that uh, on that subject, the you know they've only got two or three launches left approved budget wise but you know there are other private companies out there now taking up the reins some of you might have heard of google's lunar x prize Mm -hmm. which is kind of the next evolution of the x prize google oh google's lunar x prize yeah yeah, the the first x prize was just launch a space flight yeah and And then the the new one is yeah land on the moon yeah so uh yeah there's people vying for this multi-million dollar prize and just the honor of getting it i recently read an article too that a private company was uh looking into very seriously taking over uh running the space shuttle, privatizing the remaining space shuttle. And when asked about, you know, well, NASA is retiring the space shuttle because of safety concerns. Aren't you worried about that? They say, well, we've got 30 years of experience on how to operate this thing. We're not concerned. That, you know, that does have something going for it, but I wouldn't be flying to the moon in that thing. I mean, no. Not, well, but yeah, I mean, I say. 30 years old, right? I don't know. But think about how far computers have come I, in 30 years. Let If some private company think wants Think how far I've come in 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if some private company wants to do it and they want to put like their next generation high definition streaming satellite up there or something, let them. They might as well just strip the whole thing out and, and put in the all new software and hardware though, which yeah. at that point, are you really flying the shuttle or just something that looks like the shuttle? Well, it's like when, when people go find those really old cars, right? Like I, I have a buddy who went and got a, a Volkswagen truck. Yeah, from from like an old parts shop, and he completely tore it out completely and rebuilt a brand new car, and still calls it a Volkswagen truck. <laughs> so, <laughs> not saying that space shuttle is a Volkswagen truck, but <laughs> it's a little worse than one actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyways, I mean, that thing needs to retire. I, there's nostalgia, and and you know, we're using it as our backdrop. You know, it, yeah. it's an iconic thing yeah, nowadays, yeah. but yeah. It's got to go go bye-bye. Uh, an interesting last story I thought maybe uh, we could end on, which also came out just uh, today. Yeah. The 8th. Mm-hmm. Uh, February the 8th, 2011. That's, is, that's today. Well, this is an interesting thing because it's, it's been, what, just a little over a year or so that the whole uh, Toyota debacle of the cars that were sort of on the runaway, you know, taking off and speeding. You know, I before we get into the story too much, I do want to point out that I never really bought into that. Oh, yeah? I didn't either. <laughs> I don't want to be Mr. Skeptic Pants either, but no. I, I like that. Just sounds like, and, and I heard one it of sounds the, like a, a, a. Here's what it sounds like to me: like two different people, both driving Toyotas, both veered off a cliff or something, and some guy that knew somebody at a network or a newspaper yeah. knew both of them. You know, I heard an interview with one of them uh, on one of our local radio stations here in the Seattle area, and it it sounded like her story was changing as she was giving the interview. Mm. Uh, but. So Toyota got stumped on this whole problem. Toyota took the electronics back from their cars, the ones that were reporting these issues, and they ran it through every type of testing that Toyota could come up with. Mm -hmm. And they just are like, we cannot produce a problem. Right. From what we can tell, there isn't a problem. We can't do it. They're like, we need somebody who can generate conditions that we can't reproduce, like radiation or electronic, you know, electromagnetic interference, uh, all kinds of different conditions that cars might go under depending on where they're at Mm -hmm. on the road. And so they went to NASA. 
Yeah. And they said, hey, guys, can Who you Who better guys- to emulate freaks of nature than NASA? <laughs> can you guys radiate our stuff and, and throw electrons at it? And then, <laughs> and then can you run it through the tester and see if maybe once these electronics are abused, if they start producing errors, they could cause this. Yeah. So NASA threw everything they had at it and came back and said, we're incredibly confident we didn't find a single problem. There weren't a fault. There wasn't right. a fault. In, in in NASA's perspective, they don't see how these electronics could have caused this problem. It. I don't think it was ever a problem to begin with. I think this was one of those media monster things where just somebody heard it from somebody and ran with it because it sounded like a nice sensational story. Uh, yeah, and and it's a it's it it's a sucked. scary one for people. It's a good one for the radio because you got people in their car and it's like, yeah. what if your car took off on you? And you're like, what? Uh, <laughs> But and so somebody in the chat room mentioned, you know, Toyota's uh, theme is moving forward. Yeah. Even when you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It, who knows? You know, you'll never know for sure, I suppose. But it does seem likely that it could have been a sticky gas pedal. Um, I mean, you know, a mat jammed up underneath the thing. Sure. Those are just manufacturer Cruise defaults. Cruise control that, gone awry, maybe. I don't. Or, but no, because. They tested it. Right. Yeah. That's part of the electronics. Hey, you know what else is tested? Every single episode of Jupiter at Night tested. And tried and true. And, and usually we fail. Yeah. <laughs> but we do it live over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash live every single Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 8 p.m. Pacific. You didn't mention Monday. I know. Well I know. done. Thank you. I think that's a first. Thank you. I, I'm, 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 hey, you know, it's like 89 episodes in right. or something like that, but I'm figuring it out. Um, you don't have to worry about the time exactly. If you just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, we have all our live productions on there as well as a time zone converter. And that's pretty handy. Mm -hmm. But if you join us live, you get to hang out in the chat room and give us feedback and tell us when we're wrong right on the air. Or in or be humorous so that we don't have to. Or in the case of some some folks actually send us in links and stuff to stories yeah. that we get to incorporate live in the show. Actually, like two out of three or four of the, of the links we've got tonight are from a member of our audience, Mars Base. Yep. So... So big thanks to Mars Base. Who's, right, we uh, didn't have to work that hard. Been our resident NASA helper and expert. Mm -hmm. So thanks to her, and uh, thanks to you for tuning into this episode of Jupiter at Night, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs>